Miriam, thank you so much for joining us today for Visionary Heroes. Thank you, Kirsty, for the invitation. It's amazing. We've been doing this for about almost a year, and you are our first CEO that we've had. So we're very keen to get your view from this perspective, but that's not the only role that you have. So can you please explain the roles that you have at BlackRock? Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, Kirsty. I was hired to BlackRock as a, a CEO for the Swiss business of BlackRock in its entirety, uh, but also in a second role as a senior advisor to BlackRock Sustainable Investing. And for those people where it may not be obvious, what does sustainable investing actually mean? Considering ESG criteria in investment decisions, so buying and selling of securities, but it also means to consider ESG criteria and ESG risk, climate risk, when engaging with companies as an investor. So it's really throughout an investment process from buying a security, holding it, engaging with the company um, to selling it again. Uh, that's uh, definitely an important aspect, but also then when we come to index investments, which is a large part of BlackRock's uh, assets, managed assets, then here we really look at how indices are composed and how the, uh, the index owner actually integrates those ESG criteria by, for example, over and underweighting certain uh, companies, securities and uh, sectors. So how long have you been in your roles as CEO of BlackRock Switzerland and as a senior advisor to BlackRock Sustainable Investing? It's been four years now. And when I was hired, I was hired as the CEO of BlackRock in Switzerland, but also as a senior advisor to BlackRock Sustainable Investing, which at the time was, was a, a, a rather small function at this very large firm, but grew tremendously over the last uh, few years. And how have you seen the sustainability space or the conversation change during that time? Yeah, I think that's a great question because before um, joining BlackRock, I've been working in the space of sustainable finance for a long time, so for over a decade, really. And uh, I've really seen this uh, space develop in the sense from being a very niche topic to, I think now, almost becoming mainstream. I'm saying almost becoming mainstream, probably we're not quite there yet. Um, and perhaps right now we're feeling a little bit of a, uh, a pushback because of uh, the energy crisis and the macro crisis that we, that we face today. But uh, overall, I would say there's no serious asset manager globally that would not think about sustainability and would not try to integrate those aspects in their uh, investment decisions and, and launch products uh, that uh, answer the demand that we see in the market for such products. So when we think about sustainability, you know, there's the, the metrics aspect, it's the KPIs, it's the importance of data. So that's something that we, you know, see as very important to be able to measure progress, you know, how how are we reducing our carbon emissions? You know, how more diverse is our workforce? But how do you evaluate the sustainability of investments? What criteria can be used? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And especially the metrics are absolutely key uh, in investing. Um, if it were just a fluffy topic and, and you'd say, well, this is a bit sustainable, a bit more sustainable, then you really uh, expose yourself uh, to these greenwashing accusations. So the industry as a whole, as a, the has management industry, and, and for BlackRock can, can say that um, with a lot of confidence, we're watching this very, very closely. And we want to make sure that we don't uh, call something green and sustainable, which isn't uh, uh, on the inside. So that means um, that we carefully look at the investment processes and actually have the process um, and these, for example, this ESG integration checked by our uh, risk management function. So we look at uh, ESG risks as any other investment risk. And so our internal risk function that looks at all investment processes actually also checks um, how portfolio managers at BlackRock integrate those ESG risks that 
he is speaking for the active um, space of our business, but also when we look at the index investments, how these index funds are constructed, what uh, indices um, they're built on, how the index uh, addresses sustainability um, issues, what the potential impact of such investments would be. And, and here, you know, we touched on a, on a very tricky topic. How do you measure impact and uh, measuring change, be that uh, with impact, we speak about measuring change, what happens before you invest and, 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 and then when you, when you measure again, um, it's important to have very reliable and robust metrics that you can rely on. Is BlackRock helping, you know, international bodies to set those metrics or to improve those metrics or to expand those metrics? Yeah, uh, I would say we have a very close dialogue with um, industry associations, industry bodies, the UN. So we regularly um, engage um, with these different stakeholders, with our public policy groups. And uh, so we try to give them our opinion on, you know, what's, what's reasonable and what's always uh, in the best interest of our clients. Because as an asset manager, we have a fiduciary duty. It's not our own money that we invest. It's always the money of clients that we invest. And so we have to adhere very strictly to an investment mandate. And by default, these investment mandates, let's say for a pension fund, it is to maximize long-term investment returns. So these long-term investment returns cannot be compromised uh, by, by taking, say, sustainability-led decisions which then uh, would lead to lower long-term risk-adjusted returns. Okay, so there's two things I want to get on there. So one, the first one is you're talking about climate risk, yes. you know, for example, as an, as an example. And I think, you know, traditionally climate risk was, was sort of one of the main topics that was focused on, but biodiversity is also becoming more important. Um, how do you see that evolving and how do you see biodiversity being you know, integrated into this risk assessment? So essentially, this is where BlackRock's journey began in sustainability when Larry Fink, two and a half, almost three years ago, communicated to the world our belief that climate risk is investment risk and sustainability risks are investment risks. And we take those risks into consideration in our investment processes like any other risk like inflation risk, for example, currency risk. And we do this um, based on our fiduciary duty to our clients. Um, now, with climate risk, it's not simple, but it's, it's fairly easy to get reliable data on, uh, say, for example, carbon emissions of a business, especially if we speak about scope one and two emissions, mm -hmm. where we uh, look at what uh, emissions a company has from its own business and the use of, um, of, of energy, for example. But it gets a bit more difficult with scope three, uh, three but we can cover that later. So, this is fairly easy, as I said. Now, when we look at, say, nature-related risks, and here uh, we speak of uh, biodegradation, we speak of biodiversity risks, uh, and so on, then it gets actually very tricky. How do you measure that? And it depends very much on where you look at biodiversity risks. So, uh, here, geospatial data is very important. So you can actually look at the biodiversity in a certain area at, uh, at, at one point in time and then look at that uh, biodiversity again with the same measuring approach, um, say, 12 months later. But while you know, biodiversity risks look very different, for example, when you look at the coastal area, mm -hmm. 
it can be very different when you look at uh, a forest, for example, you look at deforestation and the impact it has on biodiversity, or you look at agricultural land and you try to understand how bio biodiversity is impacted, for example, by the agricultural method methods that are being used. So you need different measuring approaches for um, different regions, different locations, and I think that makes it very tricky. Do you think we'll come to a point where they hold similar weight? Because I think climate has been sort of prioritized, but as you said, you know, I mean, biodiversity obviously affects everything. Yeah. So do you think that it will... We have, have to. Okay. I think we have to. About uh, half of the world's GDP depends on nature, 44 mm -hmm. trillion. Uh, I read recently in a, in a report of the World Economic Forum. So... Uh, we know that we need to have healthy nature, we need to have healthy forests, we need to have um, a, a, a healthy oceans to absorb uh, the carbon emissions, to make sure that coastlines are protected. So I, my hope is, and, and also what I observe now with, for example, when speaking to CEO, CEOs of industrial companies, they realized that very well. And over the last couple of years, what happened was like almost like a fast track education process. Mm -hmm. And people now understand climate more or less. Business people understand climate. I mean, climate is very complex. Uh, and, and usually, you know, it takes a scientist to understand climate. But I, I would say now an average uh, uh, not an average CEO. A CEO of an average publicly listed company understands climate and climate risk for his business or her business and, and the industry. And they are also aware that there's this nature thing out there that they need to look at. So um, there are these global initiatives, me measuring approaches. After TCFD, there's now TNFD, that's uh, uh, a measuring approach for uh, nature risks. So I think there's a lot of education happening in, in that space. Also, we uh, spoke about that uh, prior, prior to this interview now. Uh, I would say the role of a sustainability officer at a firm uh, the company in, in the real economy has been really elevated. Mm -hmm. So now that there is a chief sustainability officer, this person will not just look at, uh, at climate risk, they will look at nature risk and what it means for uh, a certain business and, and create that awareness and also will discuss uh, approaches to mitigate those risks. I think that's why we started this series yeah. is because we saw the complexity, you know, balancing everything that's coming in externally with also sort of the internal influencing to move the company towards a more sort of sustainable pathway. Yeah. And in terms of sort of prioritization, I mean, over the past two years and more recently, you know, we've had the pandemic, we have the war in Ukraine, we have uh, inflation, we have a potential energy crisis. Have you seen that maybe the the appetite or sort of the prioritization towards sustainability has maybe changed? Or how are you seeing that? I think that's a very interesting question. And uh, two years ago, when we went into the pandemic, almost uh, uh, two years ago, um, we were all afraid that uh, we, I'm saying we were all afraid that sustainability would uh, lose its importance and lose, move down on the agenda and it would all be uh, COVID only and the pandemic and the impact on business. But uh, actually to my surprise, this is a train which has left the station. It's so long term mm -hmm. and people that are in charge of, of, of sustainability, CEOs that, that look at these sustainability risks, they have understood that this is long term, uh, that there might be distractions in the short term, but this is something companies and the economy and society needs to address over the long term. And no, we have actually not seen much distraction, and be that because of the pandemic or, or now also the Ukraine war, the energy crisis, no. Um, I would say what's happened now in finance is that uh, people who had, or clients who had little exposure to energy, fossil fuel, uh, energy, 
probably saw a certain detraction uh, in performance in their portfolios. Um, but uh, over the long term, we believe the, the topic of, of sustainability and addressing climate risk with your investment is absolutely intact. That's promising, so that's good. I'm happy to hear that. Um, you mentioned fiduciary duty. And my question is, is it's, I don't think it's a matter of influencing, but how can you steer clients you know, to, to consider sustainability or to invest more sustainably? Do you have a role to play in that? I think what's important, uh, and that is the BlackRock approach, is not trying to persuade people to mm -hmm. do something, but actually provide the facts mm -hmm. and the transparency so that a client, and we only have institutional clients, but that could be, for example, the decision-making body of a pension fund, mm -hmm. an asset allocation committee, that they have the data uh, to take the decisions and to see the risk and then take the investment decisions that would address those risks, but also address the opportunities, you know, and have, for example, show them macro scenarios um, for a decarbonized world where uh, you see the case for uh, sustainability and sustainable investing and usually it's these hard facts that will lead institutional clients who themselves have a, a fiduciary duty um, to assume a sustainable investing approach. So it, it is data-driven. It's data-driven. Okay. So if we talk about financial services industry more broadly, so what role do you see the industry playing to move towards a more just transition? It's actually, again, a very, very interesting question. Thank you for that. And perhaps uh, let's stay, take a, stay, a step back. What role um, does the financial services industry take in, in that transition, in accelerating the transition or driving the transition. And here we could observe over the past couple of years, actually, the, the role investors have played and uh, with their influence actually have, say, influenced CEOs and governing bodies of corporates to provide more, on the one hand, provide more transparency on their climate risks and ESG risks, but also then show the actions they're taking to mitigate those risks. And we at BlackRock put a, a lot of emphasis on that. We don't push companies to do something, but we say we want to see what the risk are, risks are because we want to be able to, to show that to our clients and take the right decisions. But we also want to see what actions you're planning to take. Mm -hmm. And... Here, I believe what gets measured gets managed. Once uh, company CEOs realize you know, that their investors, their stakeholders actually demand that from them, they look at it, they start to uh, analyze those risks, measure them and define measures to, to mitigate those risks. And then it just happens. It, mm -hmm. it really does happen. And here, I think investors play a huge role and have a, a very important uh, 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 say in this discussion and can really influence companies um, to perhaps uh, take such steps uh, more decisively. However, uh, all this now cannot happen if we don't have the policymakers to take the necessary action. I think what the, what, what the investment industry does, it actually takes the future into the present because of, of, of very efficient capital markets. But we need uh, the policymakers to establish uh, the regulation to, to have a le level playing mm -hmm. field for all companies, be they uh, private or public companies. Private, public, um, investors, regulators. So there is a huge ecosystem at play, you know, to, to move sort of forward on the sustainability agenda. BlackRock Switzerland is part of the UN Global Compact Switzerland as well. So how important is partnerships and these broader ecosystems to not only achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but also to drive progress in sustainability? Here, I would say we're in this all together, and we all know uh, people in finance, people in the real economy, but also people in, in, in government uh, or, 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 say, countries, uh, they know 
we we have to take concerted uh, action to to fight climate change and to protect nature. Um, nobody can do. Nobody, no institution or no company or no country can do this alone. And climate change, you know, is is so brutal and if it affects us all. Uh, if the world is destroyed, it doesn't help you much to to live in 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 Switzerland and. You know, it causes a lot of uh, bad things in the world, be that, you know, migration or a collapse mm -hmm. of nature. And, and nobody wants that. So uh, I feel there is there is acknowledgement that we need collaboration. And there is a lot of collaboration uh, already, but I think uh, we definitely need more. And definitely also to protect the weakest uh, populations uh, in this world because they tend to be the most exposed mm -hmm. to, to, to climate change. Absolutely. Do you think we're on track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030? <laughs> Unfortunately not. And, right. you know, this is, uh, this is very sad. I think we take a lot of much needed action. But uh, all these uh, crises in the meantime are very... Uh, uh, distracting, and when we look at what it would take, you know, to 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 really uh, protect uh, certain regions against uh, the effects of climate change, or to really take measure to to reduce, uh, you know, carbon emissions and so forth, uh, so forth. Um, there is money, but there's not enough money. We always say, you know, the private sector needs to do something. The private sector needs to finance more of these solutions. We speak of mm -hmm. so-called nature-based solutions, um, which can be, for example, mangrove plantation in co co mangrove plantations in coastal regions, which then protects against uh, uh, floods, but also absorb Erosion, yeah. um, uh, carbon emissions. Now. There's not that much money needed to, to do that effectively, but there's money needed and there is not much uh, return in it if you do it in a very classical way. So here I think uh, um, there's a big potential for so-called blended finance solutions where you have uh, government institutions taking out certain risks of investments to allow institutional investors of the private sector to come in and actually get a, uh, a market uh, return on their investments. So blended finance, is that is that what we need for bolder progress or what do we need? Yeah, for I think we need much more money mm -hmm. um, uh, for these nature-based solutions, mm -hmm. which in itself, you know, are not are not like uh, not say, infra infrastructure right. investments like a, a solar park. A solar park, you sell the energy and you get uh, a return on your investments. Nature-based solutions are a bit more complex. Now, carbon credits can help finance those nature-based solutions, but usually if they're situated in emerging market economies with certain risks, political risks, currency risks and all that, then uh, blended finance uh, solutions are, are definitely necessary because as an institutional investor in here, speak as, uh, as a fiduciary investor for mm -hmm. many, many clients again, you cannot compromise your long-term risk-adjusted returns to finance nature-based solutions in emerging uh, countries. Now, thinking about you know, your role as CEO of BlackRock Switzerland, how important is leadership, you know, not only setting the tone at the top, but to steer a company to be more sustainable? I think leadership is very important and also that people see on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, that, that I'm very serious about this and sustainability really matters to me, and I hope with with my day to day actions that I can also um, inspire other people to enthusiastically embrace the topic. And I would say over the past few years, it's I've probably infected a lot of people <laughs> with uh, this very positive virus. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, you've been at BlackRock in these roles for about four years, and prior to that, you were also ten years in the mm -hmm. sustainability space. There's much more time to make an impact in sustainability, but thinking about it now, what would you like your legacy to be? 
Yeah, I would I would really like to devote my professional life to advancing sustainability and sustainable finance. And while there was a lot of focus and there is a lot of focus on on climate risk and addressing those climate risks and it, it you know fulfills me with a lot of hope to see how the industry financial industry but also the real economy are taking up um uh, those climate risks and are addressing them i think the the next big frontier uh is nature nature related investment nature based solutions as i mentioned them and uh, i would really like to work towards that frontier and that we can advance that um because that's a big task but it's just as important as uh, addressing climate risks yeah, i think as we said nature really impacts mm -hmm. everything that we do so we wish you the best of luck thank you very much christy thank you very exciting okay.